Give it up for our community group leaders. And now for a quick video. Just want to give you a little bit of an update. Um, I am sick. <laughs> you can probably tell from my voice. Um, but I want to let you know that from last week, weekend, with Ron Hint being here and preaching through his sickness, uh, on Monday he went to the ICU and was in the ICU for like three days. Uh, got his oxygen up from 58 is where he was at when he went in uh, all the way back up to 96 when they finally released him on Thursday. Uh, he had pneumonia as well. He was not able to teach at our conference, uh, but he, is, uh, he has already landed in Texas as of today, Friday, and he is doing much better. So continue to pray for him. But Ron was not able to teach this week during the Calvary, uh, Castor, well, during a, a regional conference that we had. And so I had to teach for him on Monday night. Um, I also taught throughout the session of things that God put on my heart. Uh, but by Wednesday, my, my throat was killing me. My voice was gone. Uh, I was fighting a little bit of this sickness. It seemed to really hammer me Thursday afternoon when I got back. But I just want to let you know the conference was awesome. And the Lord bless abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We have an amazing staff and volunteers that all the other pastors were saying, you guys have taken care of us and your staff is amazing and your volunteers have been so helpful and it is so true. And so I'm very blessed to be a part of Calvary Castle Rock and I just wanted to let you know that the conference went really, really well. But again, I am sick and so please, please, please welcome John Winder to teach for me this weekend. God bless you. Well, good afternoon. Another. That was me that did the light up there in case you were wondering. The security was running down the aisle <laughs> looking for me or something. You know, so. Welcome to Calvary Castle Rock. So as you heard, Dave is, uh, Dave is sick. So part, yet, uh, part of what we have to understand about the way Dave preps is that his, his process is that he kind of has an idea of what he's going to be teaching on. He's going through Exodus and that. Friday is his big study day. That's his big preparation day, Lord willing. Okay, and so he was sicker than a dog on Fridays. So even if he got better and he was better today, and voila, he, uh, he wouldn't be, pre be prepared to serve you the best possible meal that he could serve you. Chuck Swindoll said that it's, it's our duty as pastor, teacher, preachers to present the best possible meal to you it's your responsibility to eat it and that's another way of saying have ears to hear what the spirit has to say to you so um, so I always have things somewhat prepared and uh, so it's all it's all good I'm excited to be before you uh, this afternoon we are going to continue our series called Christian myth busters the title of this one is, We Are Provisionists, Part 1. We Are Provisionists, Part 1. And I have in my notes where I think I'm going to need to stop because of time. I'm trying to be uh, sensitive uh, to time, and I'm not always uh, perceived that way. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, so if you need a Bible, raise your hands, and we'll get a Bible in your hands. We're going to be, we're going to have a lot of the scriptures up here, but some of them you're going to want to look up, okay? So while they're handing out the Bibles and you have your eyes open, I'll pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to get into your word. Father, we cover a myriad of subjects. Ron, last weekend, talked about how you use sickness, and that's, that's something that touches home, Father, with all of us, either personally or with people that we know, Father. And uh, we also teach, uh, uh, teach your word through, through Exodus. We're going through chapter and verse and uh, word by word often as well. We also uh, teach doctrine. We teach theology. We also, uh, Father, we want to understand what kind of church are we? What is it you want us to be as your local 
church here in Castle Rock. Uh, what is our uh, modus operandi? And uh, we pray that you would help us with that this afternoon. Bless your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are provisionists, part one. Uh, part two in the future will begin where we leave off due to time constraints tonight. Okay, just so you know. And I think I know where that is going to be, but it's kind of a moving target. So uh, we're going to, as Chuck Smith used to say, blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. Um, so around the uh, 17th century, two theological camps have dominated Protestant Christendom. Protestant Christendom. Uh, typically, if a believer was not in one of these camps, they were automatically deemed to be in the other camp. And there were really basically only two. Uh, whether that was true or not, you were kind of labeled that way. Uh, there was not a third option, basically. Uh, but we will propose a third option that we believe is closer to the Scriptures and closer, even more importantly, to the heart of of God towards sinful mankind. What is the heart of God towards sinful mankind? It is a Christian myth to think that there is no other label or theological camp by which we can be called other than Calvinist or Reform or Arminianist. Those are the two basic camps in Protestant Christendom since the 1700s. Both of those camps are named after a past prominent pastor, theologian, and not a biblical personage per se, not somebody from the Bible. Our focus will be on Calvinism, not Arminianism, which is known for our ability to lose our salvation. Most people, when they think of an Arminius, they think of you can, uh, you can lose your salvation. There are other aspects to it, but we're going to basically focus on the Calvinist camp and the provisionist camp that we are proposing. Uh, we are proposing a new theological camp called provisionist. Provisionist. Credit goes to Leighton Flowers from his teaching, teachings and his book, God's Provision for All, for the designation provisionist. The word provisionist is not in the Bible, but it also is not the name of a man from Christendom. But from one of its cognate words, provided, provided, provisionist, provided, they come from the same root words. It is used in the sense of the provision for salvation that concerns all of us. Proverbs 16.6 6 reads this way, and we'll have verses up here. Sometimes I'll have brackets in the verses. I'll give an expanded translation. I'm going to put some quotes up here from other men. So you can see that I'm not making these things up, but this is a verse from Proverbs 16.6. 6. In mercy and in truth, atonement is what? Say the word. Provided. Provided for what? Iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And that reverence, that fear of the Lord, because if you don't depart from iniquity through faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to have to face him. And it's a fearful thing to come before the God in whom you have not put your faith and trust. We, we I, have never described myself as a Calvinist or Armenian. Never, ever. In my almost 50 years of walking with the Lord, 48 or so, being a pastor, I never described myself in either one of those camps. But I didn't know what to call. Uh, I didn't know what to call my camp, if you will, only some, teachings of, only some teachings of both camps do we agree with, just some. Not very much, to be honest with you. Provisionist best describes Calvary Castle Rock's theological position as reflected in the scriptures, especially when it comes to key buzz phrases and words like sovereign determinism. The word all. Well, you think the word means all? Not in Calvary. World, you think the world means the whole world? Not in Calvinism. Election, a.k.a. also known as chosen. Predestination, perseverance, eternal security. These are buzzwords. 
And frankly, we've come to detest some of these words. We've, they, they, they've left a bad taste in our mouths, and they shouldn't, especially if they're in the Bible. What drives the meanings and application of these words with Calvinists and provisionists? In Calvinism, God's sovereign determinism is everything. It drives forward all of God's attributes, including his love. In provisionism, God's love drives all of his other attributes, including his sovereignty. You see the difference? God's heart set or mind set towards mankind and mankind's need for salvation is driven by his love that provides his provision for our needed salvation. Provisionists believe that God can love all and still have his sovereign will done, even with hell deserving mankind. Calvinism teaches that mankind is sinful, depraved, utterly dead, therefore unable to choose, so dead to God that he or she cannot choose or accept or receive salvation without first being born again by God apart from your participation. Being made alive in order that you can believe and then be saved. That's Calvinism. Once they are born again, without their involvement or faith, they will be able to believe unto salvation. Provisionists also believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and are disqualified to enter the kingdom of God as we are without Christ. But Jesus, the apostles, and provisionists never require a person to first be born again before they believe. Jesus, the apostles, and provisionists teach that you must believe in order to be born again. Calvinists condemn Arminius for teaching that, no, that one could lose their salvation. But Calvinists are no better when it comes to eternal security and never having, sal and, and never having salvation. They teach that the saints must persevere to the end to prove their election and their salvation. And they will determine what persevering and not persevering means. We will dig into these differences later on. In the NKJV, which is the Bible that we use, the New Testament, the word, the English word for provision is used once in Romans 13, 14. Here is an expanded translation of that verse. Make no, what's the word? Provision ahead of time for the flesh in order to fulfill the flesh's lust. You see what provision here means is you provide ahead of time before you do something. In this case, it's a, it's a fleshly thing. The Greek word for provision here is pronia, a provision by foresight is what it means. It means to think beforehand, and in God's case, to think and provide what we sinners need beforehand, before we need it. In God's provision through his foresight, he provided the Lamb of God, who was slain before the foundations of the world, who took away the sins of the world in due time. Which leads us to our key provision witnesses in Scripture. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, 1 Timothy 4, 10 through 11. And now we will put the verses up here one at a time. These are our key provision verses, okay? So let's look at 1 John 2, 1 through 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a lawyer, a Jared and his wife, 
with the Father. I worked with a man at Boise Cascade who was our lead lawyer, and uh, he, <laughs> I said to him one day, I said, you, and I've worked with him for years, contracts and all that kind of stuff. So I said to him one day, you're my second favorite lawyer of all time. And he goes, wow, who's your first? I said, Jesus Christ. He goes, that's pretty heady company you have me in. <laughs> we have an advocate, lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is a propitiation, a satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the what? Whole world. Okay? That's our first witness in provisionism. Second witness, 1 Timothy 4, 10 through 11. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Salvation is provided for what? How many men? All. Who does it, who does it become effective in? In whose lives does it become effective in? Those who what? These things command and teach, and that's what we do. Okay. Writing in the bullpen, waiting in the bullpen of our preferred witnesses, we add this witness from the Holy Spirit through Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. I need to give you truths established by two or three witnesses. Here's a third one. For the love of Christ compels us. Why? Because we judge. We make a judgment, thus, or in this way we make a judgment, that if one died for, what's it say? Then all died, or are died for, and he died for all, emphasis mine, that those who live should live through faith, no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. What drives his provision? What drives God's provision? Why would he do so? Provisionists believe that it is his love that drives his provision of salvation and his provisions for life after salvation, let alone his general provisions of grace for all of mankind. We ask for two or three witnesses witnesses to establish this truth. And of course, we have John 3.16 and my expanded translation. God so loved all of the world so much that he gave the only thing he did not create, his son, that whosoever out of the all that believes shall possess everlasting Life. Now, life here is an important word. It is the word zoe, and it's only found with God and to whomever he gives it through faith. The life we are born with is not zoe life. It's suke, it's soul life. It's tied to our mind and our body and our nature. But this life, zoe, only comes to those who believe. Keep that in mind. Second verse, second witness, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we're, we're answering the question, what drives him to provide salvation? So far it's what? What's the word? Love. And on a very personal level, just for me, for my life verse, we're going to read it out loud together. I have a life verse. If I'm on an island and I'm allowed one verse, this is the verse. If I'm allowed one chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1 would be my chapter. But if I'm only allowed a verse, it's Galatians 2.20. You ready? Can you say it with me? I have been crucified with who? With Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life, Zoe, which I now live in this dying flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. 
Who did he give? Himself. For who? For me. Amen? The amen was added. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 1 through 7 gives us the details of our sinfulness, his restraint due to his love, and our great salvation. You have it all in these verses, okay? In, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. Let's go through this. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 is the greatest detailed indictment of mankind in the church age ever written. It reads, And you, he made alive. And the words in italics there mean they're not in the text, but give you a sense. And you, who are the you? Those he's made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world or this age in which we live, according to the direction of the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan. The spirit who now works in or energizes the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Verse 3. Among whom also we, what's the word? All. All once conducted ourselves in the sphere of our lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the two spheres of the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature, guess what we are by nature? Children that deserve what? Wrath. Just as all the others. Everyone is in that camp. All of us here we're in that camp, but if you don't know Jesus, you're still in that particular camp. There's no escaping that indictment on your own. All are indicted. There's no escaping the title, children deserving of wrath. So what were you called when you were younger, John? I was children. I was a child deserving of wrath. Do you say that about your kids? No, you don't, do you? There's no escaping the title, children deserving of wrath, on your own. All are children of wrath. But what follows verse 3? Obviously, verses 4 through 7, where we see God's provision and the driving force of his provision, his love. Let's look at it. But God, who is rich in mercy, mercy here is restraint, deserved wrath, deserved punishment. But God, who's rich in mercy, the first thing he has to do is hold back from judging children of what? Wrath. Why is he rich in mercy? Because of what? Because of his great what? Love. That's what? That's driving his mercy. That's, that's telling himself, I'm going to restrain from destroying John and Ray. I'm too grateful for that. Because of his great love with which he actively, continuously loved us. Even he even loved us when we were spiritually dead in trespasses, when you were a dirty, no good, low down, yellow bellied, lizard licking, cancer stick sucking mole digger. That was me. <laughs> he still did it. And he made us alive together with Christ. That word alive there, guess what the root is? Zoe. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved through faith, according to verse 8. We're not going to get into that. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We go from the outhouse to in Christ. Pretty cool. And God's not finished. That in the ages to come he might show 
the exceeding riches. How many of you would like to have exceeding riches when you get to heaven? Yeah. I, okay, if you didn't raise your hand, come, raise your hand. Come on, hurry up. There you go. <laughs> I know you. You want that. <laughs> the exceeding riches of his grace. Well, you, grace means you didn't earn it. You don't work for it. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, kindness is kind of one of those neat words. Fruit of the Spirit is kindness is one of those, and goodness is another. They're similar words, but they have different, they come from a different direction. Kindness is towards those who don't deserve it. Goodness is towards those who do. Do we deserve this grace? No. Okay. So we're, we're looking at where does he come from? His love for us drives everything he does. Everything he does. His love is the motive engine that drives his sovereignty and his will until the consummation of the ages, the dispensations. Not so with Calvinists. What drives God according to Calvinists? Sovereign determinism drives God according to Calvinists. Sovereign determinism is the fundamental problem in Calvinistic thought. Calvinist James Montgomery Boyce, the late pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, stated emphatically, and we're going to read what he had to say, we can never exaggerate the importance of God's sovereignty, for it is the greatest of all realities, indeed the very ground of reality, and so sovereignty is the most important thing that can be said about him. The other attributes of God are also important. But if in our minds we ignore, distort, or deny God's sovereignty, meaning the absolute determination and rule by God of all his works and creatures, God will no longer be God for us. His decrees and acts will be determined by something else either by mere human beings or by circumstances or by some other cosmic power. And these other things or nothing will be our actual God. In order to be sovereign, God must also be all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolutely free. If he were limited in any one of these areas, he would not truly be truly sovereign. Yet the sovereignty of God is greater than any of these attributes. We couldn't disagree more. Provisionists believe that God can drive his sovereignty and accomplish his will through his love for everyone. He's big enough to do that. He's great enough. He's powerful enough. He's smart enough to do that, to drive his sovereignty by his love for all of mankind and he will accomplish his will on this earth. God is big enough, creative enough, powerful enough to accomplish his will by using the free will of men, man, which is a part of man's image bearing of God, free will. And end up with his being, his will being done on earth as it is where? The God of determinism is not big enough or creative enough or wise enough to allow mankind to have total free will and still have God's will be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. But my God is big enough to drive his sovereignty by his love and allow us free will. And he'll get it all done, his plan. Ephesians 1.11 is a key verse that describes our larger, wiser, loving God. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of, his, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Is he limited in any way? No. 
It's one of my wife's and I's, are one of our key verses in our life. He will work all things to accomplish his will and allow us free will and love us at the same time. Amen? My God can work all things, all choices of mankind, and use them in the fulfilling of the counsel of his will. He is free. He is able. He is not restrained. He works all things to accomplish his will. How does reform Calvinism make determinism work scripturally? Because they do love the Lord. They do love his word. Determinism requires biblical grammar gymnastics. Calvinists have changed the basic meaning of biblical words to fit their theology. The only way Calvinists can support their theory from the Bible is to alter the basic meaning of Bible words or take them out of context. When a Calvinist teaches whosoever will come, he means whosoever God wills to come. Calvinist A.W. Pink, 1886 to 1952, who sparked a renewed interest in the exposition of Calvinism. And he has some great commentaries. But you got to throw the bones out. You got to spit the bones out with the meat. Dave uses him. I use him. You got to be careful. He wrote this The fact is, the love of God is a truth for saints, the saints only. He said, the world, in John 3, 16, must, in the final analysis, referral, refer to the world of God's people only. Sovereign determinism. When a Calvinist talks about sovereignty of God, he has his own definition of the word sovereignty, as he does with the word depravity. Easton's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says that the sovereignty of God is his absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. God in his sovereignty has established some laws for mankind. For example, the, Bi the Bible says in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. God in his sovereignty has determined that the sinner who does not repent will not gain eternal life. We see as provisionists that God is no less sovereign because he, according to his own good pleasure, gives mankind a free will, making him capable of repenting of his sin and receiving Christ as his or her Savior. The word world. Put it up there. Somewhere we have the... There we go. The English word world is found 209 times in the New Testament. A few times the Greek word obviously reveals different meanings. However, the word world never equals Calvin's so-called elect. Never does the word world equal only the elect. The only reason for rejecting the obvious simple to understand meaning of the words whosoever or world in John 3.16 to support Calvin's heresy. The word all. Nobody argues that all means all in Romans 5.12 when it says all have sinned. The only reason to suggest all means something else as in Acts 17.30 when God commands all men everywhere to repent. is because Calvinists need to change this meaning to provide a solution to support their theology and their view. Listen to the double talk of A.W. Pink when he says that God commanded all men to repent is but the enforcing of his righteous claims as the moral governor of the world. What Pink is saying here is that God is not sincere when he says all men everywhere are to repent, but only saying it to show how righteous and moral he is. It's demonstrating his righteousness and his morality. Then Pink uses Acts 5.31 to support his limited view. The scripture, Acts 5.31, does not declare that it's God's pleasure to give repentance to all men everywhere. Let's see what Acts 5.31 actually says. Him, Jesus, 
as God, has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Okay, so Pink uses this to show it's, repentance is not, not everyone is commanded to repent. In this passage of Scripture, Peter and the apostles declared to the high priest and the council that God had made Jesus a prince and savior, bringing repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Their audience is, was Jewish. Therefore, their speech pertained to the Jews only they were addressing. However, they were not saying that the Jews were the only ones to be saved and forgiven. But Pink uses this verse to support his theory that it is not God's pleasure to give repentance to all men everywhere. In taking Acts 5.31 completely out of context, perhaps Pink did not realize that by trying to use this verse to fit his own theology, he was actually saying that only Jewish people will ever get saved. Hence, all Gentiles will end up in hell. That would include A.W. Pink himself. And because there is ultimately no free will in Calvinism, there is nothing anyone can do about it. More Calvinist double talk is found in 1 John 2.2, which says, And he, Jesus, is a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the world. That's what the tech text says. The Calvinist solution, one of our key verses. And he is... You're going to put it up? The Calvinist solution. Thank you. you. Must have took a drink of water. I do that too. That's good. Mercy? The Calvinist solution, and he is the propitiation for the sins of the elect, and not for the elect only, but also for the sins of the elect. Now, I'd have to go back to my drug days to try and interpret what that, <laughs> what that means, but I'm not going to. I, trust me. I'm, not gonna, I'm going, hmm. <laughs> Total depravity is another favorite term of Calvinists. It is true that all people have, have, have depraved and sinful natures and no person merits salvation. Let's be clear. However, the word total means entirely to the full. The word depraved means morally corrupt. To suggest that all people in the world are totally immoral is ridiculous. Few of the neighbors on my street where I live confess to be saved but that does not make them totally immoral. They're, in fact, some of them are moral than some of the Christians that I've known. i got some very nice neighbors. Buddhist couple right next to me, really nice. I'm developing a relationship with them. They're, they're not totally immoral. We must not forget that God has put a conscience in all people so that all have a sense of right and wrong. Even an unsaved person can feel remorse and regret when they have done something that was wrong. If, they were, if there was total depravity, they would not have the capability to regret or admit that they have done something wrong. The Bible speaks again and again of some people who are morally, more, more, morally corrupt than others. Ezekiel 16, 47, quickly, you were corrupted more than they in all your ways. Judges 2, 19 says, they corrupted themselves more than their leaders, their fathers, sorry. 1 Kings 16, 25 says, Omri did worse than all the, those who were before him. Jeremiah 7, 26 says they did worse than their fathers. However, we must remember that Calvinists have their own special meaning for words. To a Calvinist, total depravity means total inability. Inability. It's what it boils down to. The common dictionary definition of inability is not having the quality or state of being able to do something. 
Calvinism says that because all mankind is so dead in trespass and sin, no one can respond in any way to receive Christ as their Savior. They are unable to do so. Quotes from well-known Calvinists. A spiritually dead man cannot exercise faith in Jesus Christ. Gordon H. Clark. The sinner is utterly incapable of willing anything. A.W. Pink. A corpse does not cry out for help. Arthur Custon. We have no more to do with our spiritual birth than we had with our natural birth. A.W. Pink. Even if what he or she does is simply to repent and believe the gospel, God's grace is seriously, albeit unwittingly, compromised. Sam Storms. The sinner is of himself neither capable nor willing to receive that salvation. Herman Hoeksema. The Bible stresses the, the total inability of fallen man to respond positively to the law of God. Kenneth Talbot and Gary Crampton. The sinner of himself cannot repent and believe. A.W. Pink. Provisionists believe that all are spiritually dead, but able to understand and to believe. Versus, Calvinists believe the totally depraved and spiritually dead need to be rebirthed before believing. Before believing. I know, I have the same look on my face too sometimes. Every person in this world has a God-given responsibility to repent, believe, and be saved. And one day, every person will be held accountable for those responsibilities. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all Likewise, perish. There is not a group of non-believers who will be able to say, Lord, I did not repent and trust Jesus as Savior because I was totally depraved and unable to believe. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all, he wants all to come to repentance. God holds us responsible for our life on earth. And we are commanded to repent of our sin and trust Christ as our Savior. Calvinists teach that believing the gospel requires a new birth first, before you believe. Calvinists teach that man can, cannot repent or believe the gospel until he or she is born again. They teach that this new birth is brought about by God who cho chooses certain elect individuals and regenerates them, making them capable of believing. They say man does not have a free will by which he or she is able to come to Christ for salvation. The Bible always puts Believing first with life as a result. Witnesses. John 3, 15. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but what do they get instead? They have eternal life. Zoe. Next verse. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Which, what comes first? Believes. What follows? Eternal life. Have everlasting life. John 3, 36. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. What's the condition to have everlasting life? Believe on what? The Son. John 5, 24. He that hears my word and believes on him that has sent me has everlasting life is passed from death unto Life, Zoe, John 20, 31. But these many signs are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might then have life through his 
name. So what's required in order to have life is belief, faith. Calvinist said, no. In order for you to believe, you must be first made alive. Then you will be able to believe. Life in these verses is zoe, and it only comes from God. Our life before Christ is suke life, soul life. Zoe life comes only after we believe. True Calvinists would read these verses like this. Whosoever is born... Okay, I'm going faster than you, sorry. Oh, all right. Whosoever is born again and is now is eternally alive, and then believes, will not perish. Whosoever is born again, and is now eternally alive, and then believes, will not perish. Is perseverance eternal security? Many Christians wrongly assume that the Calvinist theory of the perseverance of the saints is synonymous with the doctrine of eternal security. We teach eternal security. Assurance of eternal security is a different animal altogether. You, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure, and if you don't feel like it, too bad... You are eternally secure. And there are steps you can take to come to a place where you have this assurance of your eternal security. And we have documents on that. But it, just because you don't feel like you're eternally secure doesn't make it a fact. Okay? But in Christendom, the perseverance of the saints, was a, which is a core doctrine of Calvinism, is synonymous with eternal security. The biblical doctrine of eternal security teaches that one who has been truly saved by God's grace is kept eternally saved by God's grace. What condition you're going to be in when you go in there into heaven? Will you hear the words like Joey has heard, my good and faithful servant? You may not hear those words, but you'll be there. God has not left our eternal destiny and our ability to persevere. For God to do that would result in salvation by works. Let's get some quotations here. Citing Augustine, Calvin wrote, Those who do not persevere unto the end do not belong to the calling of God. Calvin also stated, What they, the Christians at Corinth, had attained so far is nothing unless they keep steadily on, because it is not enough that they once started off on the way of the Lord if they do not make an effort to reach the goal. In A.W. Pink's book, Practical Christianity, Pink taught, if there is a reserve in your obedience, you are on the road to hell. Pink also said, something more than believing in Christ is necessary to ensure the souls reaching heaven. Calvinist theologian, co-founder of the Westminster Theological Seminary, Dr. John Murray states, let us appreciate the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, recognizing that we may entertain the faith of our security in Christ only as we persevere in faith and holiness to the end. In Dave Hunt's book, What Love Is This? He shows that the terms Arminius or Arminianism were essentially created by the Calvinist camp to quickly discredit non-Calvinists by saying they don't believe in eternal security. And that's what Arminians are known for, that you can readily, I hate to use the word, readily lose your salvation. 
or in the grace of God for salvation. So are we, this afternoon, misrepresenting Calvinists? There are some Calvinists who will argue that we have misrepresented Calvinism. One problem is some people are called Calvin Calvinists. Others are called Thomas Fuller Calvinists. Arthur W. Pink Calvinists. Presbyterian Calvinists. Baptist Calvinists. MacArthur Calvinists. And so forth. It would be difficult to misrepresent It would not be difficult to misrepresent somebody's version of Calvinism. Many people who call themselves Calvinists never read Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion for themselves. They are merely following someone who taught them something about his own brand of Calvinism. Some preachers have taken a few classes on Calvinism in a Bible college and then spend the rest of their lives supporting it because they liked the professor who presented it. Determinism, Reformed theology, a.k.a. Calvinism, has trained us to dislike certain biblical words, none more so than the words election and predestination. And we will get into that, part two. So we're going to close. We're starting here. I know this is a miracle. You're all going to pass out. It's early. (laughs) So Margaret and I were involved in the church, and I was in leadership. I was one of the elders and in uh, Chicago, and the pastor only taught uh, 25, 30 minutes, and I told him, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting my money's worth. It cheated. We need at least 45 minutes, you know. And, uh, and I told him, I said, sermonettes make for Christianettes. <laughs> so what drives the teaching of the truth around here? What drives your faith, which is what you believe? So your faith is a body of truth that you believe. What drives your faith? Do we realize that faith and love are found together in 21 verses, all in the epistles, the letters written to us, the church? Faith and love together. And generally, they're found working together in these verses. Work and love are linked together in three verses. So work, the word English word work and love are linked together in three verses. Labor and love are found together in two verses. Believe and love one time. So what's the point? The point is, in our belief, and in our work, in our labor, in our activities, they're to be linked with what? Love. Love and do, love and do, the word, those words, are used together in New Testament 12 times. Love and God are used together 33 times in the New Testament. Love and who we are, who God is, works together in whatever we do or say. God help us. May we be a church that believes in the truth. I believe we do. And that we are driven by love. What drives you, love or fatalistic determinism? Love? fatalistic determinism. Do you believe that your God is big enough that his love will drive his sovereignty and allow men and women free will and yet accomplish his will 
on earth as it is in heaven. We get an amen on that? So let's pray and take communion. Okay? Gracious Father. Father, I'm just, I am awed. that you love me. Love me enough to provide for my salvation. And in my salvation, Father, you have not left me and all my brothers and sisters here without provision for a godly life here on earth. You continue to provide body, soul, and spirit. We're so grateful, Father. I pray that if anyone here has not changed their mind about Jesus Christ, they would realize they have the responsibility to do that today. Tomorrow may not come for them. Father, I ask that you would just touch the hearts of everyone here that uh, we would work together to be provisionists, that we would be driven by your love and your truth together in our communities, in our neighborhoods, at our work, here, in our community groups. I pray, Father, that those who do not feel connected here, that they have the opportunity to get involved with the community group. They meet twice a month, and what a great time of fellowship and discussion and communion that is as well. Pray they'd avail themselves of that. And Father, we are about to partake of communion because you never want us to forget that it was your lamb that you sent for my sins, for our sins. And you, you command us through your son to do this in remembrance of him. So. so while the communion team comes forward, we will worship, hang on to the elements, if you need gluten-free, see Bob. Either way you spell it, it's still Bob. Hold your hand up high if you need gluten-free. Hang on to the elements. We're going to take them together.
Cracker? What? Heavenly Father, in our community group last night, we were talking about those things that would humble us, and we are to humble ourselves in your sight, and, and uh, you do often humble us because uh, we need it. But Father, uh, I can't think of anything more humbling than being at the foot of the cross and observing your son dying for me. Looking like he's been put through a meat grinder. So unrecognizable you can't even recognize that he's a man. Father, we're just, we're going to use words because we don't have anything else. We love you. We're humbled by that. And his body was broken for us. Father, we're so, so grateful. And Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's take together. Then Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the cup. And this is the blood of the new covenant for you, for the remission of your sins. Wow. wow. What drove him to do that? Was it determinism? Was it sovereignty? Or was it love? Thank you, Father. You sent your Son. Shed his blood for us. For you've declared without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So here we have it. We have it. It's still fresh today. Because it was God's blood that was shed. Thank you, Father. Praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody, take together. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glory in his presence. And he who has begun a good work in you, he will perform it in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Love you guys. You guys stand with us and sing one more. Wow. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. God bless you guys. If you'd like to talk to somebody or pray with somebody tonight, come on down. We'd love to chat with you guys. Oh, the joy. 